book of Exodus. Uh, <coughs> Roger's going to be, well, was going to start a series on Exodus tonight, so I'm going to get it started for him, and then he'll carry on with it. So, uh, really just going to kind of do an introduction to the book of Exodus, kind of pick and choose a little bit out of it. I don't want to go too deep into it, because um, I don't know what he has planned as far as uh, teaching on it. Uh, so kind of just give you an overview tonight uh, and really kind of uh, want to show you um, how the book really points out who God is and also points us directly to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, every time we study a book in the Old Testament, we want to look to see where we can find Jesus Christ in it. And he is deeply involved in all of this. Uh, we're going to see, uh, hopefully get time for it at the end, but we're just going to kind of pick uh, some of the things that we see in this book that are pointing the nation of Israel ahead to the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, so as you probably know, it didn't take you long to get there. It's in front of the Bible. Exodus is the second book uh, of the Old Testament, and it's one of the books of the Pentateuch, uh, which is the first five books uh, of the Old Testament. The title that we give it, uh, Exodus, is derived from the Greek word exodos, meaning to exit or departure. Uh, it's not hard to figure out because we're getting the heck out of Egypt, right? Uh, the uh, Hebrew name for the book is Wa'ela Shemoth, which that means uh, these are the names of. And if you look at first sentence there, chapter 1, verse 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel. So usually uh, in the Old Testament, the way they named them in Hebrew was the first few words of that book. Okay, so their name for Exodus is, these are the names of. Okay, uh, we give it a little fancier name from the Greek. Um, Moses is credited with being the author of the book, and it uh, covers a time generally accepted as from uh, 1450 to 1410 B.C. Uh, the way they came up to that, according to 1 Kings 6.1, uh, the exodus took place 480 years before the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. Uh, since that year was uh, figured to be 996 B.C., it matches up with the exodus occurring around 1446 B.C., somewhere in that time frame. Okay. Uh, so we know who wrote it, we know what time it covers. Uh, there are two basic themes that prevail uh, in this book. Uh, first one is deliverance, as we'll see you know, as Moses leads the Israel nation out of Egypt. Uh, and then redemption. Uh, the word redeem is used nine times uh, in this book. And we'll see uh, as we get further into the teaching you know, and the study of this, uh, some of those times that that word redemption is used and what, what it means. Um, Exodus really lays out the foundational theology uh, in which God reveals his name, I am, that I am. Uh, his attributes are given in this book. Uh, his law and how he is to be worshipped. You know, and it talks about his redemption uh, of his people. And so there's a lot of things in this book that give you a good theological background as to who God is. Um, we also see in it, the, it reports on the appointment of Moses to be God's mediator uh, between himself and Pharaoh, and then ultimately between himself and the nation of Israel. Uh, and he's the mediator of the Sinaitic Covenant, uh, which is the Ten Commandments and those things uh, that, again, we'll get into later. Um, it also describes the beginning of the priesthood, uh, the Levitical priesthood uh, in the nation of Israel, and it develops the covenant relationship between God and his people. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff uh, in this book. Uh, it's, about, it's 40 chapters. Uh, it's fairly long, but there's just a lot, a lot of good things in here. Uh, like I said, good theology on who God is. Uh, so we look at it, a um, little bit of the history. 
we look at the end of Genesis, uh, chapter 50, uh, and it says uh, the death of Joseph. We're going to start in verse 22. Uh, it says, So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So from that point to where we pick up in Exodus, about 400 years. Okay. So we're looking at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation but the people of Israel were fruitful and, increasingly, and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So from the time uh, Joseph's brothers uh, and Jacob come to Egypt to where we pick up here uh, in Exodus is about 400 years that have passed. Okay. So really Exodus continues the history of God's chosen people and describes their deliverance out of Egypt uh, and really their development as a nation. Uh, we see uh, in Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve and then their descendants uh, all the way to Noah. We have the flood, Noah and he's, his three sons and their wives and their generations on through that. Then we have uh, Abraham, you know, his story, Isaac and Jacob. And then finish out Genesis with Joseph uh, being in Egypt. And so really this Exodus is just a continuation on of that history of the nation of Israel, starting with Adam and Eve, going on through now uh, to where we pick up in the time uh, of Moses. Um, it gives us uh, not only their development as a nation, but really a, a development as a theocracy, uh, which is a nation or a form of government with God at the head of the nation. Uh, remember, they didn't get, have a king. They didn't need a king. God was leading them uh, and using Moses as his prophet to help guide the people. Uh, so really, having God at the head of everything was the way it was supposed to be. That's the way it was intended for the nation of Israel. Uh, and we see it doesn't take them long you know, to stop doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, Moses leaves them alone for a little while and they end up making a golden calf and worshiping it uh, while he's on the mountain. So it's easy for us to point fingers at uh, the children of Israel, but uh, it's a lot easier to look in the mirror and say how quickly do we wander away uh, from God. You know, so don't be too hard on the Israelites. They were just like us. So it describes the birth and the history and the call of Moses by God to lead his people out of bondage in Egypt and into the promised land in Canaan. Uh, through the Passover lamb, uh, the sparing of the firstborn son, along with the miracles of the ten plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea, God showed his people that not only was he more powerful than the Egyptian pharaoh and the Egyptian gods, uh, but he was the sovereign Lord, that there was none and there is none greater than he is. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure Roger will discuss the plagues when we get into that portion of the book. But each one of those plagues actually identified a Egyptian god and showed that God was more powerful than that Egyptian god. So you wonder why the ten plagues and, and, and all that? There's a reason for it. Uh, we don't understand that because not many of us are Egyptologists. Uh, but God was, and he knew exactly how to show dominion uh, over those false gods. 
So we see uh, Moses leading the people uh, out of Egypt. Uh, and once they crossed the Red Sea and arrived in the wilderness or in the desert, uh, God gave them His righteous law uh, through the Ten Commandments. Uh, and He also declared that they were to become a nation of priests, a holy nation, set apart as a testimony to other nations. You know, so they were God's chosen people. Uh, the Ten Commandments demonstrated not only God's holiness, but also taught the Israelites how to love God and how to love each other. But in that process, it also demonstrates how all fall short of the holiness of God and need a way of access to God that provides forgiveness. And at the end, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the chapter, we see uh, the establishment of the tabernacle, uh, the sacrificial system, and the Levitical priesthood is set up uh, to provide that access uh, to God for the forgiveness of sins or the covering of sins. So any questions up to this point? Why can't we get along nowadays? Because <laughs> we're not any different than we were back then. <laughs> it is. We don't learn that much from history, do we? No, we don't. Well, you know, sin nature, sin nature gets us every time. Yeah, and that's, you know, turn to the book of Judges, that's a good reminder. Follow for a little while, follow off. Everybody does what's right in their eyes. Get in trouble, send a judge. Come back to the Lord, fall off. Everybody goes their own way. Uh, again, everybody's like that. It's like you said, this human sin nature. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's take uh, a moment here and let's look at uh, kind of just a quick outline uh, of the book. Um, we see uh, it's really divided into two sections. The first section uh, is the redemption from Egypt. That's chapters 1 through 18. That's when Moses leads the people out. Uh, we see them in bondage and subjugation in, in verses 1 through 12. Uh, and then we see the redemption out of bondage from 12 through 14. Uh, so we, again, we get that image of redemption out of that. And then the journey uh, to Sinai and their education uh, you know, in, in chapters 15 through 18. Uh, and then the second part, we have revelation from God. We have the giving of the law, uh, verses 19 through 24. Uh, the institution of the tabernacle in chapters 25 through 31, uh, the breaking of the law in chapters 32 and 34, and then the construction of the tabernacle in chapters 35 through 40, which take us to the end of the book. Um, so in a little bit of time we have left, um, let's kind of break this down and look at where we can see Christ in the book of Exodus. Uh, it really, the book doesn't contain any direct prophecy regarding Jesus Christ, but there are a number of things here that point us to that Savior. Um, the first one is Moses. Uh, in many ways, Moses is a type of Christ. Uh, it shows Moses as a prophet, as a man of God. Uh, both are kinsmen redeemers. Uh, who knows what a kinsman redeemer is? If you've been in my Sunday school class, you better know because we just finished Ruth. Kinsmen aren't they related to Yeah. So if uh, you have uh, a husband who dies and leaves a widower, and that man has a brother, that brother's responsibility is to marry that widow and produce an heir for his brother. That's the kinsman redeemer. Uh, how is Moses a kinsman redeemer? Moses, being a Hebrew child, uh, you know, we all know the story of his mother putting him in the basket. Pharaoh's daughter finds him. You know, not going to bore you with all those details. Ends up, you know, growing up in the palace. Uh, one day kills a Egyptian slave driver. He flees to Midian. 
He's in Midian for 40 years. God speaks to him. He comes back. He redeems his kinsmen, his fellow Israelites, out of that bondage and slavery in, in uh, Egypt. Um, how is Christ the kinsman redeemer? Well, he was a man just like us. He redeemed us back to his father through his death on the cross. <clears throat> um, Moses and Christ both renounced their power to serve others. Uh, Moses was a prince of Egypt. He had it made. He had you know, pretty much everything and left it all uh, and ended up going face to face with Pharaoh uh, for the release of his people. Christ gave up heaven to come to earth, uh, gave up his glory uh, to walk among us. Both of them function as mediators, you know, uh, as we talked about earlier. Both were lawgivers, uh, and both are deliverers. Moses delivered his people from Egypt. Christ delivers us from our sins. So, um, we look at the Passover, uh, and this is a very specific type of Christ as the sinless Lamb of God. And I'm sure Roger will get into the Passover when it gets to that part. Uh, but you had to take a lamb, firstborn lamb, spotless. Had to kill the lamb. You know the story. Take a hyssop branch, uh, paint the doorpost of your house so the angel of death would pass over uh, and spare the firstborn son in each household. Uh, we see Christ going to the cross uh, as that spotless lamb. Uh, you know, we see in John uh, one twenty nine, uh, when Jesus is walking and John the Baptist sees him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, so we see that Passover lamb pointing us forward to Jesus being God's lamb uh, and being sacrificed uh, for us. Um, <coughs> Through Exodus, we see uh, there are seven feasts which are uh, implemented, and each one of those feasts portray some aspect of Christ. And again, I'm not going to go into all those because I don't want to step on Roger's toes. Um, we see uh, while they're in the desert, uh, manna and water. Uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The Israelites didn't have anything to eat. God provided them bread. Uh, the Israelites didn't have anything to drink. Moses struck the rock with his staff. And water poured forth. And Jesus talks to the woman at the well. He says, I have living water. Whoever drinks from me will never thirst. You know, so we see again, these both portray pictures of Christ. Um, the tabernacle, you know, God's dwelling place among men. The tabernacle was to be constructed so that God would have a place to meet with the Israelite nation. Jesus is the ultimate tabernacle because in his humanity he walked among man. He was Emmanuel, God with us. You know, so we see that you know everything. Uh, in the tabernacle, you know, was set to represent God's throne and actually portray a future Savior uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, so any questions on any of that? All make sense? Good. I'm feeling better. <clears throat> so the book concludes with an elaborate discussion on theology of worship. Uh, Though it was very costly in time and effort and monetary value, the tabernacle and its meaning and function points to the chief end of man, which is namely to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Um, by the means of the tabernacle, the omnipotent, unchanging, and trans transcendent God of the universe came to dwell, or tabernacle, literally tent, among his people, uh, thereby revealing his graciousness and his nearness. Uh, and we see that, you know, as they would camp, as they would go from place to place, first thing they do is set up the tabernacle. They had, you know, set a
plans drawn up where each tribe was supposed to set up around the tabernacle, north, south, east, and west. God was in the middle of the camp. Okay. He was among the people. Yeah. And when the pillar of smoke sat in one place, they knew that's where to set the tabernacle. When that pillar started moving, they knew it was time to get up and go. Yeah. So not only was God among them, God was leading them. So when we look at this book of Exodus, um, you know, like I said, the theology of who God is is there. We see the person and the purpose of Jesus Christ is clearly displayed in this. It points directly to him. You know, as we see the sacrificial system set up, we see the tabernacle set up, we see the giving of the law you know, and the Ten Commandments all pointing to Christ. Um, we see at the beginning of the book um, the people of Israel were working. Now they were working as slaves you know, building and constructing things for Pharaoh. We see at the end of Exodus people of Israel are doing what? They're working. They're constructing the tabernacle, you know, learning how to worship. You know. Following God doesn't mean that your life's going to be easy. Following God shows you that there's work to be done. We know when Christ left and he instructed his disciples, go make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them all that I've taught you. We as Christians, followers of God and of Jesus Christ, still have work to do. You know, there's things to be done. Yeah, so the Israelite people, when they were working and doing what they were supposed to, they were doing all right. When they stopped doing what they were supposed to, they got in trouble. So let's not get in trouble. Let's keep doing what we're supposed to. Okay. Any last thoughts before we close up? Yeah, so if you get a chance, start reading. Read ahead. It'll do you good. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, close this evening in prayer.